Okay, I presume I'm audible at this point. So this is an exercise in uh, tag team lecturing. You probably, I guess you guys don't watch worldwide wrestling and see tag team wrestling? Never mind. Okay, I'm gonna uh, follow on from Joe's introduction and sort of switch gears completely and go to talk about what I think is the important um, mathematical underpinning of what you need to do and in this context. And how I got involved with this was from an interest in what I'm calling contact robotics. And the reason that I think this is important is because of the fact that but as there's a, uh, whether you know it or not, there's a resurgence of interest in robotics and you, you now have uh, robotic vacuum cleaners, you have predator drones that are scouring the skies of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we're shortly going to get to the point where we're going to have robots uh, involved in the domestic life of uh, Americans and Europeans. We're going to have robots that are moving in the same environment as humans. And when you do that, one of the key problems is how do you handle physical contact between the robot and the human? And how do you make that a, a useful thing? If you can make it work seamlessly and not only make it safe but make it effective, you can uh, consider robot collaboration with humans. Well, what I'm going to try and argue and convince you of is that if you look at the control theory, those of you who have had this uh, education, you've been uh, inculcated with the idea that in control systems, you're, you're managing signals. And the signals perspective is very, is, is very uh, useful. And we typically represent it by block diagrams. You saw block diagrams in, in Joe's talk. And the key idea of a block diagram is it's a representation of a mathematical operator. I give it a signal in, I do something to it, I get a signal out. But the important part, part of the block diagram is the output does not affect the input. If you want to have that put in there, you have to add that in as a separate, as a separate operational block. Now the good news about this is that if you have blocks that do not influence each other, I can concatenate them in any way I want. I can take block A, block B, cascade them, no sweat. The, the composition of those two operators is simply obtained by uh, operating once, then operating twice, and so on. What this gives you from the point of view of a, someone trying to design and analyze a control system is a very powerful way to think about the combination of multiple operators. So that's one of the reasons it's one of the implicit foundations of control theory. The problem that you have when you look at contact robotics is that that's not a very good description of what happens during contact. As soon as you contact something, you get a physical interaction. And earlier, Joe talked to you about Newton's law, basic Newtonian mechanics. Well, one of the f fundamentals of, of Newtonian mechanics is that for every action, there's a reaction. You can't push on something without, without it pushing back on you. And more fundamentally, if you think of the possibility of having energy exchange from one object to another, you can't get energy exchange without a bilateral effect. So fundamentally, when you have contact, you have two-way interaction, not one-way interaction. And that means several things. One of the things that that means is that when you then contact an object, the dynamics of that object now become part of the dynamics of the object that's contacting it. So if I've designed a control system for my arm and I go pick something up, the dynamics of the object that I'm holding on to become part of the control loop. And the second thing is that the combined behavior of me plus the object is not a simple composite of the operators that describe my dynamics and the operators that describe the object dynamics. So this was the problem that um, I got involved in quite some time ago. And one of the possible solutions to this is, this is annoying me. Can people hear me with this or is it? I hate these things. One of the possible alternatives is rather than control, uh, describe control systems as collections of operators, like block diagrams, what if we describe them as physical systems? Now, when I say that, one reaction, and it's reasonable, is to say, well, wait a minute. How can that help? Isn't a control system always a physical system? So what, what do you gain? Well, the, the way I like to think about that is that computers and controllers really process information, whereas physical stuff processes energy. 
Now, by that I mean that if you think about computers or brains or any of these things, of course they consume energy, and of course energy is important, but that really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't tell you much about the system. So think about it this way. You can get all the thermocouples you want and stick them on the top of your laptop, and from measuring the thermal properties of your laptop, could you figure out what the laptop was running? Windows, OS, Linux? Well, you probably could figure out whether it was running Windows, because Windows is such a hog, but... <laughs> but other than that, the point is that you couldn't tell what the, what the software application was from the energetics of, of the machine. Of course, the energetics matters to how fast the machine goes, but it doesn't tell you what the machine is doing. So energy is largely irrelevant to what the computer is doing, the signal processing. Because of that, if you look at the physical constraints in computation and signal processing, they're, very, they're quite sparse. As far as I can tell, you've only got two constraints. One is that you're, you have to have temporal causality, that is the output has to happen not earlier than the input, and in practice it has to happen later than the input. That's a temporal sequence of input to output. And then secondly, you have a, uh, you have a constraint that the variables have to stay bounded. Mathematically, we can wave our hands about infinity, but in practice, you have to have bounded variables. But as far as I can tell, that's the only constraint that, that you've got. Output after input, and nothing, nothing unbounded. Now I go look instead at physical systems, or more correctly, at the mathematical models of physical systems that we have developed. And what you find is that they're much more constrained. There's far more constraints on physical systems than there are on, on information systems. And they're constrained by the laws of mechanics, physics, and especially thermodynamics, and that can be used to advantage. And I'm going to try and convince you of that. So that was the reason, or the perspective that I took on this problem of interaction control. And my perspective is that if I'm considering manipulation, the manipulation fundamentally requires interaction. I can't do a whole lot of manipulating without touching things. That means then that the object behavior will affect the control of force in motion. No way around that. Now you look at the fact that because of this two-way interaction, I cannot physically get independent control of force and motion while I'm interacting. Right? The reason for that is because the object behavior provides a relation between force and motion. So if I'm carrying a mass like this, then yes, I can move the mass around more or less any way I want, but the forces to do that are now determined by the object. So I cannot independently uh, control them. And if I then look at the kind of behavior that I uh, encounter commonly, if I move an object, I have a dynamic constraint. If I contact something which is effectively rigid, I have a kinematic constraint. These are things that determine what I can do if I focus only on the control of either force or motion. You want to control force? Can't do that if you're not touching something. You want to control motion? Can't do that if you're, if you're contacting a rigid kinematic constraint. So that's not going to work. If you try to control force or motion in one of the, the conditions where you can do it, say, control motion while I'm moving in free space, you can do that, but you need to have a detailed model of the object dynamics and the manipulator dynamics. And that's not unreasonable, but it can be a problem, particularly because usually the object dynamics are very poorly known. And my favorite example of when they're going to be poorly known is if I'm designing a robot to interact with a human, the object the robot's interacting with is poorly known, and the likelihood that we're going to get a good model of human dynamics anytime soon is essentially zero. Humans are complicated. It's not, it's not a very practical thing to attempt to do. Okay, well, suppose we considered the standard... Um, excuse me a second. Suppose we take some of the standard um, con control system approaches to this. Well, I could say, well, look, the object behavior is kind of like an external disturbance. It generates forces that disturb what I want to do. Well, the problem there is that in standard control theory, we typically will assume, will assume that the disturbances that I'm trying to regulate against are not dependent upon the state of the system that I'm controlling. They're independent in, in some sense. And that's not the case if I'm moving an object around, because the size of those forces depend upon what I do. Secondly, the usual assumption is that this, the disturbance forces are small in some sense relative to my, my control authority. I can push harder than the object. That's also not true, because the disturbance forces are often very large. 
maybe I could treat the, the disturbance forces due to the object behavior as some sort of modeling uncertainty. You can do that a little bit, but the real problem that you run into with that is that normally when you're considering modeling uncertainties, you assume that you have a relatively good model over some frequency range of interest where you're trying to do the control, and the uncertainties are sort of outside that. They're like, say, fast dynamics that you don't, that you don't know very well. And that's not really good either. If we consider two people shaking hands, then what you find is that, oh, I see Patrick is busy. I so suppose we shake hands, right? We do this, and both the motion and the force depends upon what you did and what I did. And both of us are approximately equal strength. He's probably stronger than I am. Both of, us, both of us move approximately at the same frequency of movement. He's probably faster than I am. But to a, to a certain extent, we have the same magnitude of forces, same frequency range, same approximate behavior. And both of us determine what, what happens. So none of these ex ex standard assumptions work very well. So the alternative is to control not the force, not the motion, but what I call the port behavior. And this is something that I preach about at great length. People say, oh yeah, impedance is a version of force control. No, it's not. We're not controlling force, we're not controlling motion, we're trying to control the relation between them. So a port behavior is the system properties or behaviors that you see at a place where you interact with something. To make this mathematically uh, definable, I define an interaction port by a pair of conjugate variables that define power flow. These variables can be multidimensional. Basically, you pick all the points where you contact, have contact between two systems. The number of dimensions is up to you. But for each of them, you have to define both a set of forces, more generically efforts, and the, con the conjugate set of, of uh, flows or velocities. And these two are constrained such that the net power transported into the object is the inner product of those two uh, sets of variables. Now the reason that this is important is because this is a piece of physics, is that whereas my ability to control force is very much determined by what I'm contacting, for example, if I'm not counting anything, I can't control force, my ability to control motion is very much determined by what I'm contacting but this port behavior is completely independent of contact and interaction. It's basically, it's the behavior of the thing. So if we could make that the object of control, it may have some benefits. Okay, how do we characterize port behavior? Well, this is very old engineering. In fact, the notion of characterizing interactive behavior can be traced back to the middle of the Victorian era, although it really only matured in the hands of Oliver Heaviside in the 1920s. So you may have heard of impedance and admittance. Well, what's an impedance? Well, it's a, it's a concept from electrical engineering circuit theory, and it's essentially a dynamic generalization of resistance or conductance. Here's a, the standard Laplace domain description of an electrical capacitor, which is volts out per current in, function of the Laplace variable, and a linear capacitor has this form, electrical inductor has this form. Normally, the concept of impedance or admittance are used for linear systems, but there's no reason to stay with that. You can generalize these uh, operators to nonlinear systems. For example, if we assume a state-determined representation, that's not necessary, but it's the common assumption in almost all of modern control theory. A state-determined representation would simply have this form, where I've got some set of state variables here, could be a lot of them, that depend upon state and input. Here I've specified the input to be a velocity. I get an output map that gives me force as a function of velocity and these impedance states. And the main, con the main constraint is that these two sets of variables have to be constrained such that their inner product gives you power. With that, I can depict this. This is a state-determined depiction of a general nonlinear uh, impedance. As a detail, this, if it's state determined, then I know I can derive it from a network of pieces that are connected together. More on that later if we have time. Okay, what's admittance? Well, from electrical circuit theory, people think of admittance as the inverse of impedance. And it sort of is, but more correctly, it's the causal dual of impedance. And let me explain that. Thank you. 
So in the case of electrical circuits, if I took an electrical capacitor, then essentially the admittance is the, is the inverse of the impedance. And for an electrical capacitor, it's the current out for voltage in function of uh, the Laplace variable. So it's capacitance times S. However, the real, th the re the real difference is you're swapping the input and output. And that's what I mean by the causal dual. Causal means causal in the sense of operational causality, which operator oper operates on which. If I take the case of a nonlinear system, I can define a nonlinear admittance. This has input force, state equations, output velocity, function of the state, state variables in the input, constrained so that the inner product of force and velocity is power, as it always required. This, is, this can be well defined, but these functions may not admit appropriate inverses. So I can find a causal dual of impedance as admittance, but I may not necessarily be able to, to find the inverses. That's probably a, a, a fine point, but it turns out to be important. Uh, a word on terminology. In the context of electrical circuits, impedance and admittance are, are defined in terms of current in and voltage, uh, current and voltage in or out. If you accept an analogy that says current is like velocity, voltage is like force, then you could say, well, mechanical impedance and mechanical admittance are velocity in, force out, force in, velocity out. Two comments. One, the analogy or the best analogy between a mechanical and electrical systems is still debated after literally 100 years. The first analogy was introduced by Maxwell, and there are still people debating this back and forth over a century later. The second point is that if you're concerned with mechanical systems, choosing velocity as a potential input is not very good. The reason for that is because it's a peculiarity of mechanical stuff that position or configuration plays a very important role that's not re well reflected in electrical circuits. For example, if you consider finite rotations, which are very important in mechanical systems, finite rotations of this, pro this nasty property of not being a vector. If you simply describe things in terms of an angular rotational velocity as your input variable, angular rotational velocities are vectors. Instead, I think you need to describe them in terms of finite rotations as a possible input. So for that reason, I think it's more appropriate to work with a displacement variable as input for an impedance rather than a velocity. That has been called, uh, well, that's dynamic stiffness. I don't like that term. The reason I don't like that term is that for engineers, the term stiffness usually connotates a linearized version of something, and I don't want to restrict myself to linearity. So I prefer to use the term impedance for any operator that has motion as the input variable and effort or force as the output variable, and then impedance is the opposite one. We could debate the terminology, but this is essentially what I'm going to use. Okay, so now we come to having sort of laid some uh, foundations. Uh, what are the causal, causal considerations if I'm trying to design a robot or something like a robot? to interact with and contact objects. OK, so just think it through. The collection of objects that your robot is going to have to interact with will include things like masses. And uh, inertias are typically the minimal model of most movable objects. They've got, it. they've got inertia, they've got weight. The other thing is that I'm very commonly going to have to deal with constraints. And the constraints are a good description of what happens when you move into contact with a surface. Well, with a constraint, you've got a strong, uh, a strong constraint. <laughs> a surface constraint provides a strong restriction on the kind of representation that you can use. In particular, if you have an inertia, a mass is best written as an object with force in motion out. Because the reason, if, if you write it that way, then you get the motion by a series of operations that include integrations. So noise properties and causal, causal considerations become easy. More important is that if you look at the constraint, the constraint requires that you describe it as force in motion out. Think about it. If you try to describe contacting this surface as something where I have motion as the input variable and force as the output variable, how do you do that? It's not a well-defined function. Force in motion out, no sweat. It says force in. At some points, the motion out is zero. That's how I des describe the constraint. So now I've got this. Uh, causal consideration that says almost all the objects that I'm going to interact with will be well described as things which have force in motion out, 
I'm going to design the machine to interact with them. So because of this two-way interaction, then ideally I should try to make the manipulator behave like the dual, the impedance. That is something which takes motion as an input and gives you force as an output. And that's the idea behind impedance control. It has some advantages. This is a movie of um, Jan Brunig's son. Jan Brunig worked with Ernie Fassi, one of my uh, doctoral students. And it shows you the kind of things that you can get if you're concerned with contact. So this is Jan's son playing with this toy. You've probably seen them where there's shaped holes and shaped little pegs that have to go into the holes. But one of the subtleties of this is that as soon as you put the peg near the hole, you can't see the hole anymore. So it's actually a problem that really requires contact. And this is in the context of some work done uh, on Oscar the robot. And Oscar, there's a lot of system that's not shown here. There's a camera looking down from above that can find the objects. There's the little hollow ball with the shaped holes. Here's Oscar. Goes to make a movement under servo, visual servo control. And of course, there's some error. But now the contact forces, as long as you can deal with them, can be set up so that the interaction itself repositions the, uh, the object, and after a few tries, the robot succeeds. Now, as you can see, this is a very, the, the robot, those of you who are familiar with robotics, so you can see that the robot control loops are not terribly fast here. But the main point is that this is an approach that does work. So, what I'm advocating here is that rather than stick with the standard signal processing perspective of control system design, that a much better perspective for interaction control is a network modeling, a net network modeling perspective. But by network modeling, I mean, think of how you describe the dynamic behavior of collections of resistors, capacitors, inductors, batteries, and so on. You connect those up in a network, you get a dynamic system. And the dynamic system will be constrained by the properties of each of those elements. You do the same thing with mechanical systems, massive springs, dampers, and so forth. And you can have interaction between electrical and mechanical, and so on, and so on. The network modeling perspective, I think, gives you a much richer way to describe contact and interaction, primarily because of this fact, that the port behavior is unaffected by contact. With that assumption, then I can say, look, the causal analysis says that I've got these two functions or operators, the impedance and admittance, they characterize the interaction completely. The object is almost certainly an admittance, so what I should try to do is control the manipulator impedance. Now, if in order to do this, I'm going to be dealing with contact. When I have contact, power exchange may be possible. It's not always going to happen if I have a completely rigid contact, but if I have interaction between two things and they can both move, I'm going to dump power into the object and get power back from it. What's the best way to uh, describe systems that can exchange power? Well, from network modeling, or circuit theory, we know that there are two uh, common representations of power sources. That says the Thevenin equivalent and the Norton equivalent. Now, I, I should probably pause and ask, how many of you have never heard of a Thevenin equivalent network? That's good, that's good. So that means the rest of you have heard of a Thevenin equivalent network. Maybe I should ask the question that way. How many people have never heard or have heard of a Norton equivalent network? Okay, so you're familiar with the basic idea, right? You describe a power source as an equivalent voltage source with a series, imp a series impedance or an equivalent current source with a, with a shunt admittance. Am I, uh, people with me? Okay. So, if I have the Thevenin and Norton as the two standard equivalent circuit representations of power sources in network theory, can I apply the same structure to interaction control? And the answer is basically yes. Okay, so first of all, I do want to make sure that I can ma manage this for nonlinear systems. And the first question is, can I define an equivalent network for a nonlinear system? Well, um, the answer is kind of sort of yes, but with, with reservations. So first of all, I can define nonlinear impedance and admittance, uh, as I pointed out a couple of slides ago. I can also find a way to identify Thevenin and Norton sources, 
basically the requirement is that if you look carefully at the math, either of those, either the Thevenin equivalent voltage or the Norton equivalent current is defined by the current that, that you would get if you force the power flow to, to zero or the voltage that you would get if you force the power, power flow to zero. So you can do that even in the nonlinear case, and so you can identify these. However, the really key part of the two equivalent networks is that they have a very simple connection. Thevenin is a series connection, Norton is a parallel connection. Both of those are very simple connectors. And what that means is that in the nonlinear case, we have no guarantee of getting that simple connection. So basically what I mean is you can, even in a nonlinear case, you can define each of the two pieces of the equivalent network, but you may not necessarily be able to reassemble them by simple linear superposition, which of course shouldn't be too surprising. Nonlinear systems don't necessarily have superposition properties. So what do you do? Well, what you do is, or what you can do, is say, well, I'm just going to define all those systems for which I can find a simple connection. Basically, I assume that I'm going to get this equivalent network form, take a look at what it looks like, specify the equivalent network structure, and see what I've got. So here's, here's, the, way, here's the way it goes. I'm going to define this thing, which is a virtual trajectory. I'll explain that terminology in just a moment. I'm going to d define a displacement from that virtual trajectory. That is a difference between virtual trajectory and a virtual velocity and actual velocity. Think of this as similar to what Joe was saying earlier. There's a place you want to be. There's a place you actually are. The difference between those two is a displacement. Take the derivatives. That's my virtual velocity. This establishes the essential connection that I'm going to use. And that, in fact, is what's going to give me the key superposition properties that I'm going to get. Then I define an impedance that depends not on the actual velocity, but on this difference between actual velocity and this virtual velocity. This I can define, and it's quite general. Order's not limited, and it could be as nonlinear as you want. And I've included the possibility here that both the virtual trajectory and these dynamic functions may be modulated by some control. More on that later. What I've got if I make these assumptions is I've got a nodic impedance. Nodic means that it's a dynamic behavior that is de uh, defined with respect to a node, in particular the node determined by that velocity, and in particular it doesn't require an inertial reference frame. The big difficulty with mechanical stuff is that inertia is only defined with respect to an inertial reference frame. You start to move around or rotate and all bets are off. You don't have simple behavior anymore. Here I'm considering that set of systems which can be defined independent of an inertial uh, reference frame. Virtual trajectory, why do I call it a virtual trajectory? Well, because I'm going to make this assumption here, but this trajectory defined by V sub zero might not be realizable. I could define things from a robot where I tried to go outside the workspace of the robot. Doesn't matter. It's defined for my convenience. Say again, please. What I mean is that I'm, I'm going to describe these. This is going to be used to describe the dynamic structure. And my colon with the set of control variables, it says some, I, I get to control that in some way. So the signal processing part of the system can say what that is. Now, the, the notation could be improved, I admit, but the, ma the main thing is I don't want this to be fixed, and I don't want these dynamics to be fixed, although in some examples you'll keep both of them fixed. Let me see if I can make this a bit. This is a, I hesitate to put this diagram up here. My favorite version of physical systems theory and network theory is based on what are called bond graphs. I think they're great. Most people hate them, so don't worry about it. Here's another way to think about the same thing. Essentially, this is a, this is a very simplified version of what we're talking about. Suppose this is the system that I'm dealing with. I've got a mass interacting through a damped spring with some sort of a frame that can be moved in response to control input. And this is an idealized massless frame that the controller can move around the way it wants. This is a depiction of the control circuitry that Joe talked about. If you go look at his slides, you'll find that essentially that's what he's assuming. 
okay, break this up into pieces, and this V sub zero is what I'm calling virtual trajectory. The interaction port, the place where the pieces interact, is the combination of the velocity and force where the damped spring interacts with the mass. The mass is my object that I'm going to interact with. This is the nodic impedance. Now, in this example here, the object is simple and the, and the nodic impedance is simple. But none of the math requires this to be a simple object. This can have as, as high dynamics as you want. It could be two springs. It could be 22 springs. It could be any combination of dynamic objects provided they were only a function of the difference between this velocity and that velocity and provided they gave me a well-defined output force. Similarly, that object doesn't have to be a simple mass. It can be any object such that you apply a force to it and it figures out how to move. And that's, I think, one of the things that's going to be important. And here's a bond graph again, but you can ignore it. Okay, so if you think about this, this defines the desired interaction dynamics. It says, okay, here's the relation between velocity and force that I'm going to impose. I call it nodic, as I said, because this dynamic behavior is defined with respect to this virtual trajectory. And this virtual trajectory, it's like the, the common reference variable in a typical uh, motion controller, but there's two important details. One is that I've made no assumption that the dynamics of the system are fast with, with respect to the typical motion. A typical motion controller, you will, you, in order to make the motion controller work, the bandwidth of the, of the servo controller must be higher than the frequency content of the signal that you're trying to control. Otherwise, you don't get good motion control. I don't need to make this assumption here. Essentially, what I'm assuming is that the dynamics here can be unrelated to the dynamics of the controlled object. And then finally, this virtual, I call it virtual because it doesn't have to be a realizable uh, trajectory. The key thing that you get from this approach is that if I assume that my minimal model of an object is in inertia, then there's two important things about masses. One is, of course, is the fact that a mass resists motion such that you push on it and it accelerates. So you can't get instantaneous change of, of uh, velocity, you can't get instantaneous change of position. Fine. The other key piece is that the mass sums up all the forces added to it. And this is also built into uh, Newtonian mechanics. A mass not only determines acceleration in proportion to force, it ex determines acceleration in proportion to the sum of the forces, in fact, the, the linear vector sum. So now what I've done is I've set up a system so that if all my objects look mass-like, as in the they uh, take forces and give me motion, then I can define any set of impedances. And here I've, I've defined three hypothetical different impedances. I can superimpose them so as to produce a net effect on the object. And I get now linear summation of the component impedances, even if the component impedances are nonlinear. Now to get here, I had to make a bunch of assumptions. I, I assumed in the structure that gave me the superposition. But I've got a very, a very general representation of the control of interaction between the piece that I can control, the robot, and the objects that I wanted to interact with. I'm probably running long on time here. So I'm going to briefly talk about some implementations of impedance control. So the key point, and I find the literature is quite entertaining because there's been a lot of debate, well, should it be emittance control or impedance control? And my sense is, wait a minute. The control of robot impedance, it's an ideal. It's something that you'd like to be able to do. And in most control systems, the, con the goal of the control system is often not easy to obtain. So I don't claim that you can actually get the impedance you want, but you may be able to get close to it, which is typically what a control system designer does. So how do you do that? Well, one of the approaches that we've used has been highly successful. It's been called simple impedance control. I think a better way to think about it is simple-minded impedance control. And that is, look, this is a hard problem, so why don't we design the hardware to make it easy?
So assume or design my hardware so that I've got a very low friction mechanism, essentially a kinematic chain of rigid links, and design my system so that it's got effort-controlled actuators. For example, brushless DC torque motors with very high bandwidth uh, current control. What do I mean by high bandwidth? I'm thinking about things that interact with people. People don't move any faster than about 10 hertz, if that. I can do current control up to a kilohertz. So I can get a motor that will give me accurate control of the torque it generates well within the, the well, uh, well above the bandwidth that I'm going to actually control behavior. So I assume now that I've got an idealized motor acting on an idealized mechanism, now I'm going to use feedback, which I can measure with pretty high precision and high bandwidth, essentially to increase the output impedance from whatever it intrinsically is, which is zero, up to whatever I want. Yes? So, okay, so, so if I answer the question, it's why the emphasis on low friction? Because I'm a practical control engineer and friction is a real pain in the neck to deal with. The reason it's a pain in the neck to deal with is because friction is not a well-defined function. The standard re representation of friction is as a signum function. A signum function is not a function. It, you, give me, you give me the velocity in, I can only give you the force out within a bound, because what happens when the, force is, when the velocity is zero? You give me force in, I can't give you the, uh, the, the, the velocity out. Friction is, is really difficult to deal with in, in a mechanical system. And I think you may hear more about that from Aline tomorrow. He's, the, he's developed control methods that actually can deal with, with, with friction. The thinking here is design the hardware so that it doesn't have friction or has tiny friction, which is what we've done. Okay, and then the other piece is I want to make sure that all the dynamics of the controller are essentially stuck in the inertial mechanism. Again, that's not a, a very general assumption. But the key thing is here is I wind up with a nonlinear version of position of velocity feedback. How do you do it? Let me run it by you. So here's a typical standard model that you'll find in a textbook on robotics. You have an effort-driven inertia. These are generalized coordinates, generalized velocities, inertia times acceleration plus Coriolis, maybe gravity terms, uh, are d affected by the torques generated by my motor and the torques generated by, by interaction. And you'll notice there's no nonlinear friction term in here. Now I take this, I define the linkage kinematics that will give me a map from the generalized coordinates to whatever the interaction port is, say the hand. And given that, I can then take the derivative, get a velocity related to angular velocity or configure right, generalized, generalized velocity, and a relationship between the interaction forces and the, interaction, and the uh, corresponding interaction torques in the configuration coordinates. Take that. Now I do my assumption of simplicity. I assume that all I really want is something that's my Norton equivalent network with some uh, combination of elastic and viscous behavior, meaning some sort of stiffness that depends upon the deviation of actual from desired position. This could be a nonlinear function. I assume that I've also got some sort of function that depends upon the deviation of velocity from this virtual velocity. And again, that could be nonlinear. The main point is these are well-defined functions. Then I simply do a bunch of substitutions. Take the motor torque, it's the Jacobian times the, this force, this force is given here. Then I substitute in, substitute in for x and v, given what I had on the previous page. This is the linkage kinematics, this is the Jacobian times the um, generalized velocities. And this now is my control law. And given my assumptions, that's essentially like a variant of the proportional plus derivative position control except that it's not linear, and it very much depends upon my knowledge of the system kinematics. I take that, stick it together with the actual assumed robot model, and this is what I get. I get essentially a nonlinear spring mass damper system. And that'll implement the target behavior, which is up here. Yes? Yep. Yeah, but the be so uh, sorry, I, I should be interrupting you. Okay. So, so the piece that doesn't depend upon contact is the K and the B. 
So yes, the force will, will vary depending upon where X is, and the force will vary depending on where, where V is, right? That's got to happen. But this effective function here, K, and this effective function B, not influenced by whether you're contacted or not. Now, I, can, I'm gonna, I, I may usefully structure it to say, well, I can pick K and B so that if X is at Z, as equal to X zero, then F is zero. And I can also make that, I may in some cases make that function invertible so that if F is zero, then some sum of these is zero. But the function K and the function B don't vary with contact. Yes. So that's, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do is, is try to get those in. Now, this, as I said, this is a simple-minded version. Doing this on more realistic hardware, well, more complicated hardware, is not necessarily trivial, but it is doable. Um, one of the cute details of this is, again, assume that I have an idealized mechanism and an idealized set of motors. Well, this approach lets me interact, facilitate interaction with the mechanics of the system itself. So, uh, if, you, if you consider position control, so I, I've got a robot with complex kinematics and I want to uh, Im impose some desired endpoint trajectory. Well, to do that, I have to invert the kinematic equation that relates the uh, generalized coordinates to the endpoint coordinates. And the problem with that is that that's a difficult problem. It's, in general, it, there is no general solution. It's ill-defined. It's difficult even when it's solvable. And in response to that problem, a common approach is the so-called resolve rate motion control that Dan Whitney introduced 30 odd years ago, which is to say, well, this is hard. Let's convert it into a locally linear problem. This is the relation between generalized velocities and interaction port velocities then take this, invert it, and now we've at least got a nominally linear equation, except for the fact that this Jacobian doesn't exist if you're at singularities. So if you have singular configurations, then a motion controller is going to have a real hard time working. And keep in mind that singular configurations are not only out here, they're actually everywhere throughout the workspace. It really depends very sensitively on the kinematics. However, if I think about the mechanism kinematics, essentially, the mechanism kinematics are essentially sort of a multivariable lever, right? What, what, what they do is they relate the configuration space to the workspace. Once I've got that relation, if I relate configuration variables to workspace variables, then all of the motion variables are uniquely defined from configuration space to workspace, and necessarily, all of the effort type variables are uniquely defined in the opposite direction. So my generalized coordinates uniquely defined mechanism configuration. If they don't, you got them wrong. Right? That's the definition of generalized coordinates. Once I have that, all of these maps are always well defined. I can always get from generalized coordinates to endpoint coordinates. I can get from generalized velocity to workspace velocity. And I can always get from workspace force to generalized force and workspace momentum to generalized momentum. Guaranteed. If you can't do that, you, you did the math wrong. Um, by the way, I should mention that I gave my I gave a little handout of these slides to Patrick, who I believe will put them somewhere on the web sometime. So if this math goes by too fast, which I'm sure it does, it'll be available. As a result of that, because of the fact that none of these functions are ever ill-defined. All I did to get my so-called simple impedance control law was I transformed a desired behavior, and I made that up so I know that's well-defined, from workspace to configuration space. So if I look at this control law, the Jacobian's always well-defined. I don't need the inverse of it. The linkage kinematics are always well-defined. I, I don't need to invert them. I don't use the Jacobian inverse. I use the, the Jacobian transpose. So this control law, given my simplified assumptions, always exists. No problem with singularities. And in fact, I, I do this routinely and when I teach this material, I have students show that you can take the simple impedance controller and operate it not only near singularities, but at singularities and through singularities. And this is because we've taken advantage of the structure of the mechanic.
a word of caution, because I'm counting so much on generalized coordinates, you really have to be careful to get them right. So these are the requirements, that they have to be independently variable and uniquely, de uniquely define the mechanism configuration. Usually, configure the generalized coordinates are the coordinates of, of, of the motors. That's not always true. And a good counterexample is the Stewart platform. And if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, see me afterwards. So just be careful. Um, suppose I wanted to do inverse kinematics anyway. I mean, I want to get some control over, over the motion. Well, one of the nice ways you can go is to say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use a model that has the same kinematics as my robot, but I'm going to give it simpler dynamics. And then with that, I'm going to be able to uh, simulate a simple impedance controller faster than real time and bring it to convergence uh, uh, fast enough that I can figure out what the, its uh, uh, steady state solution is. This approach of simulating something with the right kinematics and a simple impedance controller gives you, in effect, a way to solve inverse kinematics. It's got guaranteed convergence properties, and it's a very simple way to proceed. Not only that, but you can even make it work for redundant mechanisms, that is, me mechanisms with more degrees of freedom to, in the configuration space than in the interaction space. Of course, there are what I've described here is only one very naive form of implementation. And there are lots of other ones, and I think we're going to hear more about them later on. Feedback control of, of any kind always suffers from the problems due to parasitic sensor dynamics and computation delays. And we can make them small, but we can never get, it, get rid of them. So one of the alternatives to control using the intrinsic properties of actuators and mechanism. And to do that, we could use that to control effective stiffness, but don't forget that you may want to control effective damping or inertia. But this isn't the whole story either. You may want to be able to control resonance or anti-resonance. And Patrick was t uh, tweaking me earlier on about how I didn't have any issues with impedance, or I don't know. One of my favorite things to pound the table about is impedance is not just mass spring damper behavior. Impedance is much more general, and there are cases where you want to do that. You may want to set up something to act, for example, as a vibration absorber. That's not second-order dynamics, it's minimum fourth-order dynamics, and so on. So think of it as a general thing you may want to do. Inertia is interesting. Um, how would you get intrinsically variable inertia? It turns out, and I'm sure you'll hear about it, that it's very difficult to modulate inertia via feedback. However, the effect of inertia seen at a port of interaction like my hand is a very strong function of configuration. So, with that, I could use the excess degrees of freedom to essentially modulate the inertia. So, for example, if I wanted to get high inertia, I take this kind of pose and I bump into a surface and I get all the inertia lined up behind that mechanism. Or I could take this kind of pose, now I do that and all I get is effectively the little piece of inertia at my, at my fingertip. So just by changing pose, big change in the effect of inertia, right? And this, I think, is intuitively sensible. Okay, well, so how do we do that in practice? Well, you have to be careful. Let's take the translational inertia at the tip of a three-link open mechanism. And I, typically, I'll characterize inertia by a relationship between momentum and velocity, or remember that momentum is... The derivative of momentum is force, so if the mass is constant, then the derivative of velocity is acceleration. This is basically Newton's law written in the usual form. But I'm going to try and convince you it's the wrong form. So if I take the generalized configuration space inertia and write it in the corresponding way, this, is a, this represents a generalized momentum, inertia, generalized velocity. I now know the relation between the velocity, the generalized momentum, and the momentum at the end point, and the relationship between the configuration velocity, generalized velocity, and the velocity at the end point. And so I could figure out the corresponding workspace inertia by, by writing it in this form, where I find the momentum is a function of velocity. It involves the inertia, but I now require the inverse Jacobian and the transpose of the inverse Jacobian. And while I could work this out, I'm now back to my problem of having a non-square 
J Jacobian, and hence I've got no guaranteed inverse. So this might work, but it might not. How do you how do you get around that? Well, how you get around it is that you should write the inertia in the right way. So remember, an inertia is an object that really prefers to have motion variables in, I'm, I'm sorry, force variables in, motion variables out, not the other way around. So properly what I should do is write it as a momentum in times an inverse mass gives you velocity, or in configuration or generalized coordinates, generalized momentum, inverse inertia gives you generalized velocity. If I now try to transform this inverse configuration sp uh, space inertia to the uh, tip inertia, I wind up with this expression that the inverse tip inertia is obtained from the inverse configuration space inertia by pre and post multiplying by the Jacobian and its transpose, always well defined. What's going on here? Well, how do you know that this inverse inertia always exists? Well, if I'm dealing with a mechanism that has non-zero mass in each of the links, which is a reasonable assumption, then I know that this has to be symmetric, positive, definite, so that inverse exists. So now, what about this M inverse tip? Does it always exist? Well, I can always define it, but sometimes it loses rank. So think about it. What I'm now looking at is not the effective mass at the fingertips, but the inverse of the effective mass. So if I go out to this configuration, there are configurations now in which I can apply forces, it's just that the system won't move. So my inverse inertia goes to zero, not to infinity, and MATLAB is happy. So I think it's important to consider the correct form of the object that you want. What about intrinsically variable stiffness? Well, this is, I think, something you're going to hear a whole lot more about this week. It's an idea that's been around for quite a while, although the implementations have not been so great. You can get it from something as simple as a moving core solenoid. If you look at the force versus displacement be behavior for a solenoid under constant current excitation, you get something like this. With the core near the center, you get an essential spring-like behavior. You pull the core far enough away, and the force declines. But if you increase the driving current into the coil, you essentially scale up these uh, characteristics, and you get a variable stiffness there. Of course, this thing consumes energy like you wouldn't believe. Variable pressure air cylinder has been looked at. The McKibben muscle is an old design of a tension actuator with variable stiffness. With uh, Ernie Fassi, we looked at a separately excited DC machine. Lots of different ways to do this. It's not at all clear yet what the best way to do it is, although I think we'll hear more about that. Another good example is mammalian muscle. And Joe mentioned this, and I think you'll hear more about it from Jerry Loeb. The underlying physics are very complex, but one of the key observations is that muscle stiffness goes up with muscle tension. And that seems to be about the most robust finding you can make, statement you can make about muscle. And because of that, that means that if you have a pair of muscles around a joint and you simultaneously activate them, you can do that without moving the limb, but you increase the effect of stiffness. So maybe this is a point where I believe we had agreed that I would stop for questions and send you back to Joe.